Well, Almond Small, thank you so much for speaking with me from your home in Toronto today. You are very welcome. Yeah, I'm not calling you from my um, chalet in the Swiss Alps. I'm, I'm in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> so you were a company member from uh, 1985 to 1989. Yeah. Um, how did you end up performing with TDT during this period? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was in the school. I came to Toronto like a year before. And the audition for them. It started out, I got to Toronto on a Friday. I was hoping to get into Toronto like maybe like by midday. Yeah. And call them up and see if I could book an audition. And the school was closed, the company was closed. I keep calling, calling, and somehow Kenny Pearl got my message. Huh. And he called me back. I was sitting with a friend in Toronto. And invited me to come to the audition because I have to go back to Montreal on the Sunday. So he said he would come down to the studio, direct me how to get there. I went there. I had a little ghetto blaster. <laughs> yeah. and I had some music. <laughs> and I went down and I danced my heart out. And he showed me a couple of sets, blah, 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 blah. I did all that. And then he turned around and told me, oh, my God, you know, I would hire you in the spot. But we just finished an audition the week before. Oh, so what he could do is just have me come and study in school because they were expecting someone to be leaving at some point in time, a guy, and then me be able to get in there. So I came back to Toronto for the fall and joined the school and start learning Graham technique from the bottom up. <laughs> yep. And yeah. And that went from being to school, go down, take company classes, go company class, go company class, and then eventually, I think some point in that year I got in because then one of the guys left and I did get in. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. I, yeah. yeah, so that would, I guess, would have been in 84. Yeah. Had you had any Graham classes before that, or that was the first time? No, I had Graham classes before, but, you know, usually when it comes to, like, Graham technique, it's such a specific technique that if you don't do it in New York, mm -hmm. any other place you're getting it, it's a version of Graham, right? Mm -hmm. So I've had the version of Graham in South America where I was born in Guyana. And... You know, I mean, by the time I get to that part of war, it's like geared to their locale, right? Mm -hmm. So, the, um, Graham at the school was my first opportunity to really do, like, as close to Graham as you can get if you're not in the Graham company or school. Yeah. So, you got into the company, and mm -hmm. you're... In rehearsals, what were some of the rehearsals like for you? Your your sort of first experiences with that? Okay. My first experience with rehearsals, it was good. In the in the first couple of rehearsals, you know, it was it was good because I was working with um Peter Randazzo and I had Kenny Pearl and you know, your general rehearsal, you know, like you learn the steps and blah 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 blah. And then they wanted me to learn angelic visitation. That was my first serious rehearsal. So I had one person who basically, um, it was not pleasant. So I got, I ended up with Susan Sherman. Oh. And it took like almost a week to learn it from the former person to teach me. Uh -huh. And it didn't work out. Mm. And Susan Sherman, they got her, and she taught me that piece in probably one rehearsal, literally. Really, S yeah. Suzette was amazing that way, eh? In terms yeah. of coaching yeah. and yeah, yeah, because 
the thing is, with her, she's more she was more worldly and more understanding that everyone is not from the same box of cookies. Mm -hmm. We all look alike. We all act alike, sung alike, whatever. Mm -hmm. And she was able to really tap into her teaching skills and how to work with different people. Yeah. And it just became so clear. It was, it was, I was amazed. I just learned this piece that I couldn't learn from this other individual. And she just did and was like, wow. Yeah, it was remarkable. I must say thanks to her. I, lear I learned a lot from her. Because we worked a lot together after that. And it was like just simply amazing. And so you got to perform the work? Yeah, that was one of my favorite pieces that I did a lot. Yeah, I performed that quite a bit. Do you remember um, any other pieces you like to perform? Oh, yeah, I like performing Radical Light. Oh, yes. Trish Beatty's work. Yeah, Patricia Beatty's work, yeah. And that was one of my favorite up to this day, actually. I listened to music. I was going to some stuff, and I ended up finding a cassette. And I was listening, oh, my goodness. And I keep playing and playing and playing. And <laughs> I brought back so many memories because that piece of music, um, Takata for Strings by Carl Chavez, was yeah. a famous piece of music that they used for CFCO News. That's right. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, I brought back some memories. And I remember going through the whole process learning that piece. And I must say, um, Larry McNichol, mm -hmm. he, was, he was helping to coach me with it. And it was like, he did a phenomenal job. Because he yeah. taught me some things, some things that were way advanced. You know, because when you're dancing, depending on what stage you're at, there's certain process you have to go through. It comes naturally. They teach you, but it, it takes a while to for every person to get to that point. Yes. And he was actually able to push me to that point. And that's how that worked. It, it really, really worked. It was like, wow. Yeah. It's simply amazing. To be able to interpret it and be confident in what you were uh Yeah moving yeah. in and partnering in. Who was your partner for that? Karen Duplissy and yeah, I can't remember. No, I but Karen. Karen Karen Duplissy, yeah. Okay. And same for her too. I mean, I remember when I was doing that because I was I was still basically like moved into like very serious roles and was like, oh my God. And thanks for her experience as well. Hmm. That, you know, able to talk me through it, mm -hmm. like help me to calm down and let me know, okay, this is the bumpy spot here, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And it really, really, those people really, really made, made a difference in assisting. And so the same as um, Merle Holloman. Mm -hmm. I remember she would also, I would talk talk to her and she said, oh, you know, you need to do the X, Y, Z, you need to drop here, you need to pull here, you need to do that, you need to go around or whatever. And they were just, I was like almost a baby there. Yeah. And they would make sure, there are a few other people too who helped me a lot. I guess we'll get to them as we go on. Yeah. But those are some of the most remarkable moments being at TVT. And I must say some of the best days of, of my life. It's interesting yeah. you mentioned those three women, Karen and Suzette and Merle, and they're all teachers. Yeah. Well, it's um, because I think I just find the women are much more influential in their teaching. Yeah. Every female teacher I've had from my young days to now uh -huh. have been extremely influential. Very few males were like that. And there's only few men I can name that actually taught they were professional. Mm -hmm. And they were like straight cut, get the business and that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of my other favorite pieces and Sacker is one of them. Oh, yes. And again, 
we had the same process there where I had Larry and Merle and Karen and Grace, mm-hmm. my gawa. I mean, those are people who give me a lot of tips and help me out a lot because I was like still like pretty, pretty, pretty young and like lost. Mm-hmm. And they really were very, very um, instrumental in my growth. What was it about Sacra that uh, that you loved to perform? What was it about that piece? What I loved about it, it was like it was the first time I really experienced dancing to operatic music, mm. like in a full length. Because everybody would just do a little excerpt from some opera, and you just dance to it, and that's it. And this, you know, the whole story behind Sacred Conversation and the choreography and the the intent of the choreography message was very moving. And to, like, be able to listen to this music, you don't even understand the words, but you can feel it. Mm-hmm. And when you put the steps together... And then when you look around at the dancers next to you, I mean, mm-hmm. so if you're not in the mood, you get into the mood because by the time you turn around, there's somebody else standing there. By the time you go to your, it's changing. And every time you move around, there's a whole different emotion. And that's one thing with the, with the older people. And I said, oh, I don't mean they were like old, but mm-hmm. older, more experienced people mm-hmm. is that they were able to help us on that journey, the younger people. And they wholeheartedly, they put their hearts into their dance, into their craft. And it was really inspiring because I was able to learn, too, how to reach the goal of the choreographer. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it, it worked a lot. I mean, you know, times when I turn around and you run into Grace, you know, you flip her, you know, you stand and something, you turn around, it's like, oh, there's Grace. Mm-hmm. I was like, she's in a whole different realm like oh my god like oh and then you turn around there's Larry and it's like oh my god and you turn there's Merle yeah. and you turn around you know it, it was like a, a lot of things happened they were actually like they actually shaped the piece mm-hmm. for the choreographer and the other younger dancers and new members were able to, to, to follow in and, and find their own path eventually mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. you get these going then we have people like Rene Highway as well mm. and yeah it, it was um, some of the great 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 pieces that I always enjoyed it was very very emotional you know you get to coming down to the end of it and it's like you're totally like emotionally spent and like you're mm-hmm. really like somewhere in old Europe medieval times and all this stuff is happening to you and it's like, oh man, yeah, that's great. Were there other pieces as well that you remember that you enjoyed performing? Yeah, I like glass houses hmm. and animated shorts. Uh-huh. Glass houses, but I, the funny thing, <laughs> two things with glass houses was one, before I got to doing it, I used to get lost watching Helen Jones. Mm, yeah. I was just distracted every time because like everything she went to do was like, oh my God. It was like, <laughs> it was like wow. You know, and I remember her doing glass houses. Oh my God, she used to blow me away every time because I just used to stand there trying to figure out like, how can you physically yeah. do that? Yes, <laughs> yes. Like how she manipulated her body and made things work. Cause it's like it was scary mm. because she never gave you a dull moment. Every time you went, like, my God, okay, all right, <laughs> yeah, she took my breath away like, every time. Like, oh my God, when I finally got to doing the piece, I think she had left the company by that time. But mm. still, I would always remember when I watch and Merle doing that part. I remember it was a whole different version because, it was like, it, of course, they're two different women. Mm-hmm. You know, and it was made to see her with all that length, able to like get it done, mm-hmm. make it clean, make it exciting. 
Oh, nice memories. What about, um, uh, I'm going to throw a couple of pieces at you. Uh, what about Cloud Garden? Do you remember that work? Yes, I remember Cloud Garden very well. Yeah, I love Cloud, Cloud Garden because I used to like watching Larry do it. Yeah. 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 Well, there's, there's a favorite. very beautiful um, photo uh, I found of yourself and William Elias. And oh. yeah, you're in a lunge and Willie's on your back. I can't remember that. Yeah. Because I was so, for me, Cloud Garden was Lou McNichols. That was it. <laughs> How did you like touring with the company? Oh, touring. Oh, my God. Like for the dancers, it was okay. I, I enjoy the dancers. But the politics, I never enjoy when it comes to touring. Hmm. Because I'm basically a rebel in the sense that I don't want to be, you have to be this way and be that way with the choreographers and the records. I hated that. I just couldn't stand it. So when you go on tour, I mean, when I wake up, when I'm not on tour, I'm in the city, I wake up alone. Mm -hmm. I have breakfast alone. I get to the studio alone. I get to the theater alone. When I'm on tour, I want to do the same damn thing. Hmm. I don't want to be caught up, you know, where you have to be in this group and that group. And if you don't, then you look down as negative and all that kind of, I just hated that part. Ugh, it's happening. But in terms of for the other dancers, no, I had a good time. I mean, there's, um, we were to take care of each other. I mean, sometimes somebody's back is sore. We massage each other and stretch each other out. And, you know, like those things I remember very, very well. Like those were the fun things I remember about touring. Do you think that um, those kind of political, difficult, challenging situations were at home as well and, and followed you on, on tour? At home, yeah, at home it was basically the same, but the difference at home, I'm leaving the studio and going home, mm -hmm. right? But when you're in tour, you're trapped in a hotel. Is it fair to say that you felt uh, mistreated and disrespected? I deeply feel that way. Mm -hmm. And that there was this sort of underlying, you know, racism within what was going on at the time? Yes, it was underlying. I mean, first of all, I'm a very dark, a real black person, not mixed with anything. You look at me, you see, yes, I am black. Mm -hmm. And I think at the time, no one know what to do with a very dark person. And they're, all their negative thoughts they have from their past and from what they think was playing the forefront, then they didn't even realize it. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things that happen they may look at it different now and pretend, oh, no, it's it insult. But there's a lot of things coupled with the politics of the day. But I do hope for the young dancers and the younger choreographers and directors that they do not continue what their ancestors did in the dance world. And that's one of the things that still resonates when I think of young dancers and I also my god I just hope that kind of stuff is still not present because you you're getting beaten into submission for every day of the week every minute of the day you're in the studio and it does take a toll I mean this is not people unless if you fall into the favorite group if you fall into the favorite group you usually have a, a wonderful time but if you're not in the favorite group there's a lot of things that would go on and people just pretend it's not happening so for today's generation, I do hope they're treated better. Mm -hmm. There still is this, um, you know, ongoing conversation. You know, how can um, dance organizations you know, make, you know, make uh, people of color feel more welcomed and, and safe in places that... Um, they're able to to work and be there and well, be their best selves in canada the problem with it 
for today's answers in this situation with the same old institutions that we have is that, first of all, you have, you still have, I'm pretty sure a lot of people are not well-traveled except for like going on a vacation and being in a little hotel, running around, have a nice time, look at the locals and run back in and come back to Canada and say, oh, I was in Jamaica. Or I was in Trinidad. Or, but they don't, they haven't really understand people are different. People mm-hmm. feel and see things different. This very same situation, everybody is not going to feel the same way. And until that mentality changes, you take places like Nashville, Valley, and all that, they will remain the same for generations to come. Because, like, for example, if you go, if I go to Spain or Egypt or any other place, I talk to the people. I get out of the hotels. I talk to the people. And apart from that, in my real life world, I have people from different cultures that I deal with, friends and coworkers and stuff. And it's a learning experience. I mean, like I've learned so much from dealing with other cultures that, you know, if I didn't, I would have been like a, a square peg in a wrong hole. And when you're going to be a director or a rehearsal master and you haven't really learned how to be in an open, inclusive world, then you're stuck back in the 60s and 50s and 30s. Because if you look at glass houses right now, with the dances you have to, of today, it's a totally different piece. It's got to be. It can't be the same. Because their interpretations and their feeling of the world is very different from back in the day. It's very different. And you look at radical light, if they still do it, it's different. It's got to be different because no way it's going to have the Larry McNichols feel to it and Grace Mygar feel to it or my feel and Karen's feel to it because we had a different experience in life from these younger people. Their experience will dictate how this piece is going to keep evolving. So it's the same for directors, founders, and rehearsal people is that they have to update their way of thinking and how to deal with people from various backgrounds and not put everybody in the same box. And that's where the danger has been in the dance world. It's like, it's this whole box effect where it's like, um, we all expect you to be like our favorite person over here. It's like, no, we're all different. You <laughs> come from a different background, you know, and I, I think for dance to ever be inclusive in this country in particular, people have to face reality that, you know, you got to get out there and you got to start working with different people, not only work with who you're comfortable with. And it's a comfort zone problem that is helping to keep this negative thing going on because. It's all fear. It's like if you live in a neighborhood and you don't talk to your neighbors, you only watch what you see in the news or what you hear and gossip or whatever, you will be afraid of them because you're going with what you heard. But you didn't go over there and say, hi, good afternoon. My name is so-and-so. You know, I'm your next door neighbor, you know, and, you know, and, and just talk. And if the, if the people, the directors and the choreographers are not going to get into the trench, it'll stay exactly the way it is. You just have to look around you. Mm-hmm. And you remember the days when, I'm sure you'll remember this very well, when it, it took a lot of hard work to find, no, I can't do that. Out of every 10 people walking downtown, you'd only find one black person. You remember those days? Mm-hmm. And now, out of every four, what do you see? It's like one white person, if mm-hmm. you're lucky. There's all, it is like Asian, there's Blasian, there's mixed this, mixed that. And things have changed. And it's sad that in institutions and organizations, it doesn't seem to get the effect yet. 
Yeah. You know, like, like, you know, guys, you guys have to wake up. The only choreograph piece that pretends, oh, we're fighting racism, but you don't really practice what you're trying to preach. Yeah. So for modern times, I think the idea of having an inclusive dance company or art community, it's always a romantic thing. They romanticize, oh, it's so wonderful, you know, we all can work together. But deep down inside, do you really want that? Oh. And that's where the trouble that's where the trouble comes. That's where the trouble comes. And I think sometimes in both sides of the fence, sometimes it's like, do you really want truth? Do you really want progress? Or are you just going to talk about it? And I think we all have to ask ourselves that question, black and white. Like, you know, well, we're going to make a point and we're going to honestly work together. But the institutions that have the power have to be honestly be willing to make the change and not just say because it's they'll get a bigger grant or people see them a certain way and they'll get the public to like them because they can get the little token black person there. And I, like all that has to stop. Like it's just one of those things that oh, I can't believe it's still happening. It's a lot of work to be done, but at the end of the day, people have to be honest, mm-hmm. like, Really, really honest with themselves and stop pretending. Mm -hmm. And I think once the pretense goes away, I think we all can work together. Mm -hmm. But um, ah, life goes on for me. I'm happy now and happy with the choices I made after them. And what kind of choices did you make after you left Toronto Dance Theater? After I left? I said to myself, never again in my life would I ever let any choreographer or director try to run me down with a steamroller because I'll steam them, steamroll them right back, which I was doing, but mm-hmm. it, I just developed a way to set up early notice to them. No, not this one. Mm-hmm. Keep moving. In the dance world in general, I think that's been one of the problems that have plagued a lot of dancers' careers. And a lot of the dancers who didn't have much backbone to stand up lost it. You know, because you have all these pressures. You have pressure to be as good as you can be. And then you got pressure that shouldn't be there. There's no place for it. But it's in the forefront, like some of your dancing doesn't matter. So that was the extra pressure for dancers, you know, that in this day and time, mm-hmm, I'm pretty sure that can't happen now. Did you not end up performing with Debbie Wilson and her and uh, her company? Oh yeah, I, I danced at Ballet Organ at that, Dayton Contemporary. I did Ballet Organ for a couple of years as well. Mm-hmm. Well, then I stayed with Bank Jorgen all the way through. And I went to Debbie Wilson, and there I never really had a problem. I, I had a voice, same as at Bank. I had a voice I could, like, you know, you could discuss things and talk. And you could, things were changing, too. Mm-hmm. You had younger choreographers, people from different backgrounds coming in, and things were slowly changing where they were becoming more comfortable for young dancers joining the dance hall. And I do hope it's better today. What have you been doing now since, since that time? Well, since I quit dancing, I did the little stints with him. Koba, I did some rehearsals hmm. and directing over there. But anyway, I finished with that and I... I started getting into um, trade show services because I, I really didn't want to be knocking around dance studios. I didn't want to be that person walking around. Do you remember me? And people are like, who the hell is you? <laughs> you know, or, um, 
you know, begging to teach a class here and begging to teach a class there and all the things it's got. It's like, no, I don't want to be in that. And, you know, the ongoing gossip of like a hundred years ago. Hmm. Ah, no. I wanted to walk away from the theater. And I start, I started getting into, um, due to a friend of mine who's telling me about this um, Detroit shows. And I said, you know, I, I try that out and see if I like it. And I, and I start training and shoot all the training courses and doing this and doing that. And I like it a lot. Hmm. You know, we do like the auto show and things like that. And it's nice. You know, I just go and I do what I have to do and I come home. Mm-hmm. Small, almond small. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for speaking you are with me. I know we said we weren't going to get this deep and talk about it, but I am so happy that you did, uh, that we did get this deep and that we did talk about your experiences and that you shared them. It was very honest, a real account of what it was like being a dancer for you back then. And I appreciate it. I appreciate you sharing it. I really do, Amund. Thank you.